So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is uh, Mike Clagg, and I'm the I'm the current dean of the Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I want to welcome you to what is basically a family party. Uh, and uh, and you all know why you're here. It's an honor uh, to have this event in honor of the publication of Al's book, which uh, I, I left my copy there, but called Getting What We Deserve, Health and Medical Care in America. And um, everybody knows Al. We're going to introduce him in a bit. Uh, but just say that he is, uh, he is one of the dean emeriti. He's a past dean of the Bloomberg School, a professor of epidemiology and international health and ophthalmology in the School of Medicine. So I'm, uh, it's my great honor to introduce Kathleen Keene, who's director of the Johns Hopkins University Press. The press, uh, under her leadership, has been doing a phenomenal job picking great books and authors to publish. And uh, it's America's oldest university press and one of the world's largest. It publishes 60 scholarly journals and nearly 200 new books each year. And as uh, somebody who goes and sits uh, with the Board of Trustees when they meet, I often get complimentary copies of the books and I can say how phenomenal they are. So, um, so as the, co, uh, as the uh, uh, publisher of Al's book, uh, Kathleen and the University Press is co-hosting this event with the school. So Kathleen, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. On behalf of the Johns Hopkins University Press, I'd like to add my welcome to the staff and friends uh, of the Bloomberg School, to the friends of the JHU Press, and to all of our other guests. I suspect that the expression, a man who needs no introduction, exactly describes Al Summer when presented to this audience. But I will do my duty and remind you that Alfred Summer is a graduate of Union College, Harvard Medical School, and the then named Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health. He is Dean Emeritus and Professor of Epidemiology and International Health at the Bloomberg School, and he's also Professor of Ophthalmology at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Al's well-known research revealed the consequences of severe vitamin A deficiency in children, and it established that an inexpensive large dose twice a year could reduce child mortality by as much as 34 percent. Because of his work, vitamin A supplementation has become one of the most common and cost-effective health interventions in the world. And for his work, Al received the Albert Lasker Award for Clinical Medical Research and the Danone International Prize for Nutrition, among other honors. Al's work and career bring to mind the remarkable work of the Bloomberg School, expressed in your slogan of recent years, saving lives millions at a time. The mission of the public health profession is indeed to take medical knowledge beyond the doors of a particular lab, clinic, or hospital to reach and help everyone who might benefit from a technique, discovery, or idea. The work of publishing, particularly as practiced at the JHU Press, shares that mission. In print and online, the work of the press amplifies the voices of our authors, multiplies the impact of great ideas, and delivers knowledge and expertise to a global audience in the name of Johns Hopkins University. We're pleased, Al, to be your partner in reaching all those who will benefit from your important message. We're proud to have your book appear under the Hopkins imprint, and we're grateful to Dean Clagg for inviting us to celebrate its publication here at the Bloomberg School. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Al Summer. It is uh, terrific to be here and uh, to be asked to speak. And uh, so why write a book? I think uh, Dean Clagg's already told us uh, the primary reason is to have a party. Um, <laughs> but that wasn't the reason I actually made this slide. It actually was um, to think about why it is uh, that one does write a book. Uh, some of the kinds of books that we write are familiar to all of you because it's what we do uh, as part of our work. So these are, you know, dense with data uh, and argument and trying to put convoluted ideas together uh, and reach uh, and advance the science for the 14 other people who are interested in the same field that you are. <laughs> but sometimes there are other reasons that you write a book. 
Uh, and the first book that I wrote began uh, with uh, an editorial, uh, as you can see, is over three decades old, while I was still a resident in ophthalmology at Wilmer across the street. And for reasons that aren't worth going into, particularly when I haven't had anything to drink yet, I was asked to comment on the state of uh, clinical research in ophthalmology. Uh, and the best part of all of that that I can tell you is having uh, quoted recent publications from most of the luminaries in the field and found them severely wanting. They seem to have uh, let my youth at the time uh, forgive my transgressions. But I really was very concerned with the fact that people were not using or paying any attention to basic epidemiologic and statistical principles. Uh, most uh, publications or case series of my last four cases of this is what I discovered. Uh, and so a few years later, I decided to try and do something about that by writing a small, easily read book about core principles of epidemiology and statistics that any ophthalmologist could read in an evening or two evenings. One, to better inform those who were going to do research but also to inform most ophthalmologists who were reading the literature and trying to make sense of the things that they were reading. So I did write such a small uh, tome and was advised to send it to then the uh, luminary uh, scientific uh, medical publications like uh, Williams and Wilkins, what have you, all of whom replied they thought this was a grand idea, uh, but it wasn't going to make them any money because it was uh, too short a book and it was specific to ophthalmology, and would I please make it three times thicker uh, and make it so that gastroenterologists and dermatologists and obstetricians would also find it useful. And my feeling was that would have exactly destroyed the purpose of what I was trying to write. I said the dermatologists ought to write their own book. Uh, and so I did actually have that published. That was published by Oxford Press on the recommendation of Abe Lilienfeld, who was then chairman of epidemiology uh, here at the school. And to some degree, the, that book has, in fact, uh, accomplished its mission. I've uh, um, been careful not to get drawn into doing a second, third, fourth, and fifth editions. Since it accomplished what I wanted, I let other people think about doing that. And uh, this book, which actually is available on eBay for $575, which I find quite astonishing, <laughs> since it only cost $14 new, <laughs> and that was its full retail price, uh, is, however, live as a PDF that can be downloaded for free on the websites of both the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the International Council of Ophthalmology. So it lives on. Uh, for those who uh, want to use it. So now we're here today with this new uh, little book uh, in which I try to do the same thing but a different subject. And the subject, of course, being uh, health and medical care. And I think I could only have read, written this book because I was dean of this school, uh, because I was exposed to so many smart people doing so many different things that brought me out of the discipline in which I otherwise work and maybe think about all those different things uh, that, in fact, uh, as Jill well knows, I kept telling her, I feel the need to write this. Nobody might ever feel the need to read this, but that's okay. So uh, right there in the preface, it actually thanks the Johns Hopkins University for letting me be the dean of the Bloomberg School. Uh, and its faculty, who introduced me to concepts and domains I never had known existed, and who no doubt, like for all of their students, will find errors, omissions, and commissions. Its students, who stimulated me to think and act across the boundaries uh, that separate medicine from public health, and to uh, our many supporters who challenged me to convey my synthesis and insights to a larger audience. So this is very much a product of having been at this school and having been the dean of the school. So we're not going to go through all the chapters, because otherwise you won't have to read the book at all. Uh, but it begins with what I uh, have shown previously. And some of you have seen many of these slides previously, because it's what I, I developed a ver variety of thoughts and lectures going forward, was I always found fascinating. Uh, so this, the world was flat, 
or at least the population of the world was flat, uh, for well over 2,000 years. And here you have plus or minus a couple hundred million people. Uh, you have half a billion people in the world until you get to around the mid-1700s, and then we get this explosion. And that is really quite dramatic if you think about it. Uh, and I thought about it quite a lot. And so, you know, what does that all mean, actually? And so there's this wonderful quote from C.P. Snow. Uh, those of my age know who C.P. Snow was. Those who are younger should go find out. Uh, so C.P. Snow had this terrific quote. In 18th century French villages, the median age of marriage was older than the median age of death. Now, you need to think about that for a minute. The median age of marriage was older than the median age of death. Well, the only way that a population can actually grow is that young children who are born survive in greater numbers than the number of people who are dying. And in the absence of that, which is basically what we saw for 2,000 years, populations don't grow. So what is this all about? So Jill and I were in Hobart a couple of years ago and found this one of many of which I took photos uh, of this um, in the cemetery. So this tells the whole story. Thomas Smith died age 53 years. George Edward William Smith died age three weeks. Henry uh, Edward Thomas White uh, died age um, 11 weeks. Three people buried, one tombstone, and two of them uh, under uh, one year of age. So this is already England and Wales in almost 1900. And while the median age of death has now crept up, look where most of the deaths are occurring, under five years of age. And not a lot of deaths up here. And then you fast forward 70 years, and the median age of death is now up here in the 70s. And the vast majority of deaths, of course, are in the elderly, and very few deaths down here. Uh, so a dramatic change in the demographic complex. So what brought about this dramatic change? A uh, couple of good, I think, examples. Uh, this is death rates. Death rates from tuberculosis in the United States uh, from 1900. And you can just see it virtually disappear as a cause of death. Chemotherapy was not introduced until here. So the vast majority of the reduction in tuberculosis deaths occurred before we had specific treatment for tuberculosis. What we did have was good public health. We had better sanitation, people lived in better housing, people were better nourished, we had child labor laws, we had all kinds of things so that people were more resistant to infections and could survive infections. So you can do lots of examples, only do one more. This is deaths from measles in the United States. Again, virtually has disappeared from 1900 to 1960. We didn't have a measles vaccine until 1965. Again, this had nothing to do with clinical treatment. It had to do with improving the lives of uh, people of that day. So our uh, old friend Julio Frank, who uh, is now dean at the other H school to the north, but was Minister of Health of Mexico, likes to point out, and I think quite rightly, that we concentrate primarily on the biological factors of disease and poor health. But in fact, the social factors, the economic factors, the community factors, all of these play uh, a dramatic and important role. And they're messier to deal with, so we tend not to deal with them uh, with quite as much alacrity as we do with the others. Uh, so just look at survival rates for men. U.S. whites, very high. As you'd expect, Bengalis, not quite so high. But who's the lowest? Blacks of Harlem. Blacks of Harlem have uh, lower survival than do Bengalis in Bangladesh or Indians in Kerala, India and certainly of Chinese. So there is a problem here that is not entirely made of biological causes of death. It has to do with social, cultural, economic, and a whole lot of other complex issues. Now that's not to deny, of course, the importance of biological causes. 
so we remember SARS. Today we're worried about, actually, most people don't remember SARS. I mean, that was only a couple of years ago. And to my way of thinking, we dodged a near thing. I mean, this is a highly lethal disease. Uh, the only good part of it is it wasn't terribly contagious. And that's why most of the secondary cases ended up being hospital workers. Uh, today we worry about H1N1. Remember, it was only a year ago we were worrying about H1N5, avian flu. Uh, so infections are clearly an important thing, and they are always going to be an important thing. And I think uh, our Department of Molecular Microbiology, Infectious Disease, has got uh, a long life ahead of it. Of course, some people don't quite understand the competing risks of different types of diseases. Um, so there is a bit of education that uh, needs to be done. And then one of the things that uh, I find very interesting is all these chronic diseases that we now know are caused by microbes. Uh, when I went to medical school, we didn't know any of this at all. <coughs> so liver cancer, cervical cancer, where a lot of the important work was done here. Human papillomavirus is the cause, essentially, of 100% of all the cervical cancer in the world. Gastric ulcers and cancer doesn't mean somebody's a type 1 uh, A personality or needs to have their stomach whacked out. What they need to do is be treated with an antibiotic for H. pylori. Uh, and then, of course, the whole series of neurological diseases like Jakob Kreutzfeld, uh, mad cow disease caused by these new agents, uh, prions. But we're having global epidemics of things that are not caused by what we usually think of as biologic agents of disease. So we have diabetes, we have asthma, we have coronary artery disease, and the uh, list goes on and on. But these three are amongst the three big ones. And these are global epidemics. These are just not in the United States. You find this in the developing world just like you find it here. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of attention, a lot of excitement, a lot of research, and a lot of money being spent on genes and the genome and genomic medicine. And I guess that's all to the good, but that's let funding and attention slip from what we spent a lot of time on in the United States, in, in this school, and that is the environment and behavior. And just to remind people that the environment and behavior is in fact important if you were Japanese and you immigrated to the United States, your risk of gastric cancer would plummet and your risk of heart disease would skyrocket and you probably did not change your genetic makeup as you flew over the Pacific. So then we'll jump ahead to the consequences of our own behavior. I don't know if David Holgrave and his faculty are in the audience. They can certainly speak much more meaningfully to this than I can, but I've learned a little bit from them and from others. So we do have some uh, public health triumphs in addition to the ones I showed you earlier. And one of them is this epidemic of heart disease that we had. Uh, and as I recall, uh, it was primarily brought to light during the Korean War when these young American soldiers were being, who had been killed were autopsied and the physicians were astonished to find that they had atherosclerosis, quite similar to what you'd usually see in people in their 60s and 70s. And then we learned about the association between atherosclerosis and saturated fats and the diet and what have you. And we did change our diet. And long before we had stents and bypass procedures and what have you, or statins, uh, there was a dramatic reduction in cardiovascular mortality in the United States. <clears throat> now, uh, there, it's still a big problem. And it's a big problem uh, because of what you do. So I actually made this slide up. Uh, to use uh, at a lecture I was giving at Trinity College in Dublin a few years ago. And uh, Ireland sits up here. So this is male car coronary uh, heart disease mortality for Hungary, Scotland, England, and Wales. Ireland is right up there, just didn't happen to be on the graph, which is, of course, extremely high. And then down here in Japan, France, and Switzerland, it's very low. And as I pointed out to the audience at Trinity College, uh, that that morning I had been served for breakfast at Trinity, uh, three fried eggs, a slab of ham, sausage, uh, fried potatoes, and fried tomatoes, that it, in fact they were very lucky I had been able to make it across campus to even give this lecture. And then, of course, uh, there's the issue of 
cancer. So this slide starts in 1940. The original data had started in 1900. I don't know why I, I lost the original one. Uh, but if you went back to 1900, it looked exactly the same. Essentially, the uh, mortality rate from breast cancer amongst women in the United States had been unchanged for 100 years. It's been a slight, maybe a 10% dip in the last decade, uh, primarily due to the new drugs like tamoxifen that have come along. I'm not getting it to mammography, but anyway. Uh, so essentially, breast cancer mortality unchanged uh, for 100 years. But what else do women in the United States die from? Lung cancer. In 1900, lung cancer was not even on the chart. By 1940, you're beginning to see lung cancer deaths amongst American women. And why is that? Because women started to smoke in relatively small numbers following World War I. And then, of course, we get this dramatic acceleration because women really started to smoke after World War II. And by 1990, more American women are dying of lung cancer than of breast cancer. And yet you don't hear much about women running for the cure of lung cancer, which is something we actually could prevent beginning tomorrow. It's interesting the way we do things. Now, you know, as a physician, I can't say very much. Uh, this was an ad in the Journal of the American Medical Association while I was in medical school. But that's not me, obviously. And then, of course, uh, there's another great uh, problem with obesity. And this is from the CDC slides, and I love these original ones. So the, in white are states in which 15% or more of the adult population is obese. Now we're not talking about overweight, we're not talking about heavy, we're talking about clinically obese. So that's 1991, 1993, 1995, 1998. Does that look like an epidemic to you? It looks exactly like West Nile fever looked like as it spread across the United States. It's quite extraordinary. And now, of course, something like 30% of uh, the average adult American is clinically obese. So why is that? Well, it begins in childhood, of course, and it's not limited to the United States. Uh, from 1995 to 1998, it's three years, school-aged children in Australia who became overweight went from 12% to 24%, doubled. Preschool children in Britain, 1989-1988, went from 15% overweight to 24% overweight. So we have this dramatic increase in overweight and obesity beginning now in childhood, which is, of course, the reason that we're beginning to see so-called uh, adult-onset diabetes, type 2 diabetes, in teenagers and even in uh, school age and preschool age children. So for those who can't read it, it says, remember when we used to have to fatten the kids up first. <laughs> so, you know, what's going on here? How many people here eat at the cheese factory, cheesecake factory? Nobody eats at the cheesecake factory? <laughs> I love eating at the cheesecake factory. I mean, it, the food is tasty, it's huge portions, it's inexpensive. The only problem is, is they don't take reservations. So Jill and I go there, we get on the list, and we go off to the Barnes & Noble, buy a couple of books, and two hours later we get a table. Um, but, of course, I'm not going to eat the cheesecake at the Cheesecake Factory because I'm health conscious. I'm going to eat the carrot cake because it has vitamin A in it, right? So I'm going to have <laughs> carrot cake. Now, a single slice of carrot cake at the Cheesecake Factory contains your entire daily allotment of calories. One slice of carrot cake. I don't know what cheesecake has in it, but the carrot cake will kill you. So um, it's hard to know. I mean, you don't know what you're eating. Uh, you, you really can put on weight. And you say, well, all right, we ought to educate people and get them to change the behavior. And if there's one thing I've learned from the behavioral scientists in this school is that it's very hard to change people's behavior. People really don't have free choice. Uh, so you have these societal webs. You have the individual, which is the, usually the target of our educational programs. The trouble is they don't make their decisions on their own. They have their own very close societal network, families and friends, and they belong to organizations and the people in them who influence them, their churches, schools, and workplace. And then, of course, you have the habits and the cultures and the proclivities of 
communities and society at large. So it is very hard to change behavior just by telling people, change your behavior. Um, in fact, uh, this is not in a book, because I only came upon this the other day, but I thought it was such a perfect example of how hard it is to think what would happen rationally if you did a particular health education uh, intervention. So um, I, this, I found this pretty counterintuitive and hard to predict. So some, somebody did a study. They took college students and divided them into two groups. One group was offered a menu that featured french fries, chicken nuggets, and baked potato. And the second group was offered exactly the same things plus salad, but the expectation at least some of the people who might have ordered french fries would have gotten the salad instead. So you all know where this is going, right? Those offered the menu with the salad were three times more likely to order french fries than those that were not offered salad. Go figure. I mean, how could you predict something like that would happen? So I have my five shuns to change uh, behavior. Uh, you may have seven, you can go up with nine, you can go up with 12. Uh, mine begins with education because that tells people what's wrong with what they're doing and why we're gonna slug them with it. And then we slug them with it. Legislation, litigation, regulation, taxation, all those things that force people to make changes that they otherwise wouldn't have made. And it works. You know, it's, a, yeah, it's amazing how people slow down when you point a hairdryer at them. I mean, this is what makes people change behavior. You all know that when you're driving 95, you know. You see somebody with a hairdryer, you slow down. Well, of course, our namesake, uh, Mayor Bloomberg of New York, did exactly that to dramatic uh, effect. So this was the adult smoking rate in New York, and as you know, uh, he helped uh, instigate a dramatic increase in city and then state taxes, so that at that time, uh, in 2002, a pack of cigarettes in New York cost $8. Uh, then, of course, he famously uh, ban smoking in restaurants and bars, and then they started having a uh, very aggressive uh, counter-advertising campaign. And of course, you can see that it has had not only a large, but a sustained impact on the smoking habits of New York, which is now one of the lowest prevalence rates of smoking anywhere in the country. But there was some data I came upon that I find fascinating because I haven't actually seen anybody discuss it at any length. So let's look at the group we're most concerned about. So most people who take up smoking take up smoking when they're young. So the 18 to 24 year age group is really the group that you're most concerned. They went from roughly 24% to roughly 15%. That's a huge decline in smoking. Uh, those from 25 to, six, to 64, again, around 24% smoke, not quite as much an impact, probably because a fair number were already predicted, but they went down to about 20%. Now here's the really interesting part. Those who are 65 plus, 24% of them didn't smoke before all this went on. Only 10% of them smoked. Now why is that? Us say others all died. That's exactly right. So if you needed evidence that smoking probably isn't good for your health, here is an example. The excess mortality amongst those smokers was so high that it dropped the prevalence of smoking in the age group to less than half uh, of those uh, who were younger. And of course, none of them changed their smoking habits because they're so highly addicted to nicotine that they just didn't even have a chance. All right, so then we go from uh, science to policy uh, or clinical practice or how we take care of people. And as I've spoken about many times, but using other data, the path is anything but linear and concrete. And many of you have seen this in the past. You know, today's random medical news from the New England Journal of Panic-Inducing Gobbledygook. Uh, and that's, you know, newscasters and newspapers publish what is going to get the biggest dramatic impact, uh, get your eyeballs and get your volume. So it could be coffee, smoking, or fatty foods can cause heart disease, hypothermia, 
uh, in rats, two-income families, seven out of ten women, whatever. So, and that's the way newspapers function. But it's not just the newspapers that function that way. Uh, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association function that way. That's the way they select papers and that's the way they edit papers. And I once uh, said to Larry Altman, who as you recall was a, for many years a senior medical correspondent for the New York Times, uh, complaining that you know, even the, the, the medical journals were, uh, were acting in this matter. And he said, Al, I mean, they are medical journals. So they are run by journalists. So what, why would you think they would operate any differently? But what I find very surprising, well, this is one of these examples. I mean, this is the kind of thing you can see. Fat substitute may cause disease, a top researcher says. So this is the Olestra story. So if you remember, Olestra was this fat substitute. It doesn't get absorbed. You can only use it in small amounts because otherwise it gives you indigestion, but you can use it uh, without absorbing the fat to make uh, fried potatoes, potato chips, and what have you. And uh, my uh, good colleague from Harvard, uh, Walter Willett, estimated, and this is a quote from the article, that the use of Olestra, nobody knew in what amounts, nobody knew how many people were going to use it, was going to cause an additional 2,000 to 9,800 cases of prostate cancer, 32,000 additional cases of coronary heart disease, 1,400 to 7,400 excess cases of lung cancer, and 80 to 390 more cases of macular degeneration. This is all rubbish. I mean, I don't know where he got this data from. There is no data. We don't know what causes these diseases in the first place. So we certainly don't, and we don't know how many people are going to use this stuff. And the whole premise was, well, beta carotene is really important to prevent these diseases. We have no such hard data. And this olestra, because the fat is not absorbed, is going to take all these fat-soluble nutrients and wash it through your system, and therefore it's going to increase your risk of these diseases caused by something that we really have no evidence it's caused by. But very precise numbers, wide confidence limits for precise numbers, main headline, New York Times. Um, so how do you get to stuff like that? Well, there was a lot of observational data that said beta carotene might be important for survival. Uh, and for someone who pushes carrots, you know, who am I to say otherwise? But, and this is the kinds of observational data. You, know, you simply look at people who live longer and say, what was their beta carotene level? And by George, People with a low beta carotene level had the lowest survival, and people with the higher beta carotene levels had the higher survival. Well, of course, the people with the higher beta carotene levels could also have, you know, jog three miles a day, liked sex, not liked sex, swept, uh, slept with the windows open. I mean, who knows? There are all these other confoundings which nobody can ever adjust for. Fortunately, uh, there have been actually three studies in which they actually randomized people to consume extra beta carotene or a placebo, and every one of them has shown there was no difference. Now, beta carotene didn't do anything, but Walter is already telling you how many people are going to die of prostate cancer uh, from Olestra, uh, anyway. Now, the problem is even the investigators who have done a study seem not always to understand the significance of what they've discovered. And so um, I was interested in, a, although I get the New England Journal of Medicine, I only read the articles that appear in the New York Times, like everybody else. <laughs> so there was this headline in the New York Times that uh, calcium and vitamin D supplementation did not reduce the risk of hip fractures. Well, I thought that was kind of interesting and a little concerning because uh, Jill takes calcium and vitamin D to reduce her risk of hip fracture like Lots of women do. So I decided I would actually read the article. And so I read the article, and there it is. Uh, it says right there, among healthy postmenopausal women, supplementation resulted in a small improvement in hip bone density, but did not significantly reduce hip fracture. Pretty clear cut. So I decided to actually not only read the article, but look at the tables in the article and look at the data. Now, not many articles actually provide enough data for you to do your own analysis, but this one fortunately did. And it turns out that if you exclude non-adherers and you only count people who took either their, beta, their uh, calcium or their placebo for comparison, 80% or more of the time, 
hip fractures are reduced by a third. Ah, you got to take the supplement in order to benefit from it. You can't just put it in your drug cabinet. I mean, isn't that amazing? Why wasn't that the headline? Why wasn't the headline, people who use their supplements can reduce their hip fracture risk by a third? No, it was that supplements don't do any good. It's interesting. New York Times and the abstract at, uh, and summary and conclusions of the investigator himself in the New England Journal of Medicine. Well, then, this is all the rage today is U.S. healthcare system. I promise you I'm not going to fix it tonight. Uh, or even prescribe how to fix it, but again, the idea is keeping our eye on what the core issues really are, because uh, we're, we're getting lost here in, in trivia that have nothing to do with the core issues. So uh, everyone is talking about our healthcare system. Everybody in this room knows we have a healthcare system that is neither about health nor is a system. Uh, it, it's not about health, it's about treating the disease du jour that somebody has bounced into the hospital with and get them back out again and then they bounce right back in again. So we're treating the disease du jour, has nothing about health, and of course it's not a system. It is a patchwork of irrationally designed uh, and added together political uh, opportunities of the past that defy, I think, any ability to try and make sense of, let alone to try and fix. Uh, so uh, I showed this slide the other day. So uh, Deke, Deke, are you here? Yeah, Deke's here. So I'm going to try and be clearer this time, Deke. So this is a timeline, 1900 to 1990. So it was all in the same timeline. What happened over that time? Uh, this is uh, mortality in the United States, and you see it goes all the way down. And this is healthcare expenditures in the United States, and it goes all the way up. And you notice these are mirror images to one another, that by the time healthcare spending starts going up, we've already achieved what, you know, the most important endpoint, which is reduced mortality. So we're spending a lot more money. Now, there are, you know, there are good reasons for doing that. Those of us who might need to have a knee replaced, it's going to be expensive, and it doesn't have anything to do with our mortality, but it increases our lifestyle, that, that's a, a reasonable goal. But just to show you that most of the spending uh, and the increase in spending has occurred after we'd achieved what would be the prime issue having to do with health care. So then there's all this argument is can we afford health care reform? And I would posit can we afford not to have reform? Uh, so uh, most of you know this, the United States spends this much money per capita, at least it did in 2006, which was the latest data when I uh, handed my manuscript to uh, the press. Uh, so we're spending twice as much money per capita as any of the next highest spenders. Twice as much money per capita as the next highest spenders. So like, what do we get for that? I mean, we ought to get something for that, don't you think? Well, the first thing is we get to be an exclusive company. So there are 30 market economies, and only three do not have universal health coverage, the United States, Turkey, and Mexico. Well, there's an elite group that you really want to be in, and worth spending twice as much money per capita on health care, I think, than any other. Well, we can look at other. I mean, there's got to be something that's good. So life expectancy. The U.S., not bad, 77. We're just about as good as Cuba. Cuba. We're as good as Cuba, who we starve, by the way, for their medical needs, and yet they have the same life expectancy that we do. Costa Rica has a year longer. France has two years longer. And, of course, the champ is Japan, which has five years longer life expectancy than we do. And you should recognize in 1930, in the early 30s, and certainly before then, Japan had infant mortality rates and longevity about the same as most of the poorest countries today. So they, didn't, they just weren't like born healthy. Uh, they changed what they did and how they delivered care so that they in fact dramatically uh, reduced infant mortality, maternal mortality, and increased life expectancy. So do we do better in anything? Well, I can't find anything. Uh, uh, infant mortality, there are 31 other countries that have lower infant mortality rates than the United States. Remember, we spend twice as much as any other country. We're number 31 in infant mortality. Breast cancer, prostate cancer, there are 10 other countries that, spend, that have better 
uh, survival rates from these diseases that we do. Uh, somebody did tell me, I haven't been able to track down the data, but somebody did tell me there is one uh, area in which the U.S. exceeds, and that is life expectancy amongst U.S. males who have made it to 86 is longer than in any other country. Now, I haven't been able to document that, but that's what I've been told. So our demographers can work on that. So then the question is, can we save costs? Can we improve quality? Well, of course we can, uh, and we know that implicitly uh, because physicians and hospitals practice medicine very differently. And it can't be that all these different ways of practicing medicine are right. Some have got to be right, some have got to be wrong, and balance is probably somewhere in between, but they can't all be right. And actually, the best original work of this uh, was begun in the 60s by Jack Wenberg, who is a graduate of this school. Uh, now, I do have to tell you, uh, one day on the board when I was still dean, I opened a bottle of uh, juice that we were serving for refreshments, and it actually had the inside. I was about to throw it out. I actually had a saying. Some doctors make the same mistakes for 20 years and call it clinical experience. <laughs> I mean, I was astonished. I mean, right here in our, I don't know who, or, Robin, did you order that uh, juice that day? I don't know who ordered the juice that day. I was, you know, right there. All right, so... So this is a more recent and less dramatic uh, tale than some of the early stuff that Jack published. But if you look across Medicare's per site, you can find places where hemorrhoids are injected 26 times more frequently than in others, that the benign uh, skin lesions uh, are excised eight times, uh, coronary bypass surgery is done three times. Well, this can't all be right. You can't have these wide variations of practice and say that they're all correct. Uh, and if the too many is too many, then there's a lot of cost that's associated with that, both human cost and financial cost that could be redirected to other use. And this is, uh, in fact, from uh, the latest Dartmouth uh, uh, manual on regional variations in care and the very dark uh, places are the places uh, where you have the highest Medicare per capita spending. I think nobody lives here, so that's sort of white. But, uh, but there is wide variation, as you can see. Uh, so now look at this is a great comparison. So Minneapolis, uh, the Medicare cost per capita is $785. In Miami, $3,600. This is adjusted for all the things you can adjust for. So you're spending, you know, five times as much money per person in Miami as you're spending in Minneapolis. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, I don't know if, you know, I mean, these are hardy Swedes. I can understand that. But, uh, but this big a difference can't be related specifically to what's right. And then if you look at specialists used in the last six months of life, six times as many in Miami, hospital days twice as many, uh, admissions to the ICU more than twice as many. That drives up costs, no evidence that it improves quality of life or end of life experience or people's care or outcomes. So there's a lot of money being used. Now, Uwe Reinhardt, who's one of my favorite people, a medical a health economist at Princeton, looking at these kinds of data, since we keep claiming we have the best medical care system in the world, says how can it be the best medical care in the world costs twice as much as the best medical care in the world? You know, how can these cost variations be as high as they are? And it actually was a recent article that tried to parse out what are regional factors, that is just how people tend to practice medicine, what are health factors, because people really are less or more healthy, income disparities, race, what have you. And as you can see, each one of these plays a little role, but the biggest role by uh, a lot in terms of the intensity of care happens to be the regional factors. So more providers and hospital beds inevitably mean people get more care, quote, care, and more days in the hospital. Uh, so here uh, is an interesting uh, observation that was a published New England Journal uh, comparing the likelihood of having angioplasty or bypass surgery following myocardial infarction in the United States and in Ontario, Canada. Five-fold or more uh, difference uh, between them. And when you look at mortality rates, they're absolutely indistinguishable. 
So again, there's something dramatically awry in the way we are deciding and delivering uh, the care that we do. So physicians, for the most part, who are providing care are in the pre-industrial craftsman's age. They're doing fee piecework, fee for service. They're paid for piecework, they're not paid for health, they're not paid for the quality of the care that they get. So fee for service inevitably breeds more service. Uh, and of course, if you reduce fees, but of course what you can do is dramatically leverage up volume because you're gonna establish this homeostasis between uh, what you expect your income to be and what you're gonna have your income be uh, in the face of regulatory pressures to do otherwise. Uh, this is from my own field, ophthalmology. The Barnes Eye Group at Washington University was doing cataract surgery on a fee-for-service basis. And then they switched, for reasons that still elude me, to capitation, where they're basically paid to provide whatever eye care services people needed. Uh, and there was this dramatic fall off in the amount of cataract surgery that was being done without any evidence whatsoever that people who needed cataract surgery weren't getting the benefits of cataract surgery. And then we hear a lot of talk about putting market forces to work. And you know, you hear that emanating from Washington. I'm not an economist, so you know, please forgive me for getting this all wrong, but I think it's rubbish. I mean, mar medical care cannot operate for a patient in, in a market environment. It just is impermeable to market forces. So market forces work well for insurers, for big farmers, for hospitals. They do not work well for patients because the asymmetry in knowledge between a patient and a physician or a healthcare provider and the urgency and the fear that's attendant with disease simply, you're not gonna go around asking, you know, who's the cheapest doc in town and do I want the cheapest doc in town? And you have no way to gauge that. So long ago, I came up with um, this example. So I actually, I didn't even notice until today when I was looking at it, that the person who drew it for me put, uh, you know, copyrighted the Somer machine here. So this is a virtual reality machine that I have in my den, right? And I'm telling you about this at a cocktail party. So not only can I watch an Orioles game, I can actually pitch the Orioles game. Now you may ask why would I want to pitch an Orioles game, but that's a different story. So. Um, there are two questions you were likely to ask me, and I don't know the order. You might ask me, where did you get it? And the second question would be, how much did it cost? Right? And I say, well, it cost $50 million. And you'd say, you know, I think I'm gonna wait until the price comes down. But if, God forbid, you get in an accident, you know, one of your loved ones gets in an accident or has some horrendous disease that needs urgent attention, you're not gonna ask how much does it cost. You say, I want whatever can be done, done to save their life. So it's a, the asymmetry is so enormous, the idea that market forces are gonna be beneficial, you know, they'll hold down costs, there's no question. You know, if you charge uh, people more copay for mammography, there's less mammography, it works. I mean, the mark, but they don't work the way we would like them to work. They'll hold down costs, but they're not gonna improve quality and they're not gonna improve care. Uh, and just look about, you know, all these regulations that we pass that say that Medicare cannot negotiate cheaper prices for drugs. Why do we do that? So what does Lipitor cost? And I looked up this data only about six months ago. U.S. $68 for one month. I know Lipitor well because I take Lipitor. Probably most of you take Lipitor uh, if you're over 20. Uh, <laughs> in Germany, it's $30. The U.K. is $34. We are overpaying enormously towards pharmaceutical profits. And then when the pharmaceutical industry says, yes, well, we need those profits to generate new drugs, all right, I'll, I'll buy that, except they spend 10 times more money marketing than they ever spend investing in R&D. And by the way, why aren't the Germans and the Brits and the Canadians worried about new drugs too? Why are we funding all the new drug development? So. Um, so then it's you know, the argument in Washington now, uh, you know, pay me now or pay me later. We can't afford to pay for all these other people. Well, just to point out a few facts, half the medical costs in America now are already paid out of the public purse. It has nothing to do with private financing. 
Medicare, Medicaid, SCHIP, defense veterans, national and local governments, uh, AIDS patients. These are all paid through public funds of one source or another. So we're not even talking about most of medical care when we're talking about this. Most of medical care is already being paid out of your and my taxes. And then, of course, if somebody uh, go, has renal failure or has a heart attack or gets into an automobile accident and does not have insurance, that's what the poor hospital across the street gets hit with. It's called uncompensated care. Well, hospitals would go out of business. So who pays for uncompensated care? Well, they suck up a little bit of it, but we pay for it. We pay for it because we pay higher insurance premiums to make up for the uncompensated care. We pay higher physicians' fees. We pay hi higher hospital charges. And of course, once again, we pay higher taxes because the government to some degree offsets the uh, uncompensated care. And for all those people who think that health care is a benefit, remember that if they didn't get this benefit, they would have higher salaries to begin with. So what we're doing basically is comparing this billion dollars or 750 billion, sorry, trillion, 750 billion dollars that allegedly expanding health insurance would cost over 10 years as if it were money uh, that's brand new and has to be found, when in fact we've had all these added costs all along, except it divvied up in so many diverse and opaque ways that it's impossible to follow the trail. And if you actually could start, you know, and talking about this in a rational way instead of the highly politicized environment that we're in, I think we would find that it would not cost that much more money to cover everybody. And then, of course, this is a business about rationing. Every country rations care. Uh, most countries, other market economies, the OECD, except for, of course, Turkey, Mexico, and the United States, ration care explicitly. They have a societal dialogue. They say, how much money are we going to spend on health care? And that's it. We do it implicitly. If you can afford it, you get it. And if you can't afford it, you don't get it. But we do rationing just like everybody else because there is no end to the amount of care people can absorb if they're allowed to absorb all the care they want whenever they want it. And, and this, of course, is a bane of every country. Every country's health care costs are going up dramatically because people uh, feel entitled to the latest and the greatest uh, for whatever it is that they don't particularly like at the time. Uh, and, of course, uh, a lot of this leads to a lot of uh, social disparities. So this is mammography amongst uh, black and white women here in the United States. And as you can see, there's a direct relationship, particularly amongst white women, between their uh, annual income levels and their likelihood of having mammography. Uh, and to some degree, you see the same thing, at least from the lowest uh, quartile up to the next amongst blacks. But look at this racial divide here. So you've got another issue dealing with here with these uh, uh, disparities in health. So. Now I'm going to really go out on a limb here. So all the rest of it is data, and now it's Al's ideal attributes of a reformed healthcare system. Now this has nothing to do with what they're talking about in Washington, because they're not talking about healthcare reform. All they're talking about is dithering around with some insurance premiums. So universal coverage. You know, that's the first thing we have to have so we can get away from, so it'll just be Mexico and Turkey that don't have universal coverage. Neither, none of the things that are being talked about in Washington, to my understanding, and we have people here who can explain it better, gives us universal coverage. They exclude uh, uh, undocumented aliens, of which there are, you know, 10 or 11 million people in the United States, which might seem like a fair thing to do, except when you think that your waiter or waitress or your gardener or someone might have highly drug-resistant tuberculosis, and having them not in the healthcare system is not good for them and probably isn't good for you either. So universal coverage, maybe we'll get somewhere close to that. That's got to be the first thing. Uh, then we have to decide through societal discourse on what a basic healthcare package would be. Uh, I have no problem knowing that this is America, that people with great wealth should be able to buy additional insurance that covers more than the basic package. That's fair enough. Uh, but you got to have a basic package that everybody gets. Then we have to equitably distribute the cost of care amongst everybody. I don't understand it. Maybe most of this audience could explain it to me. You haven't heard the word single payer used in the news in the last six or eight months. It's sort of like socialized medicine or communism or 
you know, I don't know why, I mean, everyone won't go near that term, but the same people who won't go near that term and have scared everyone off, off went to those tea parties this summer when their guns were falling out of their pockets and things and said, we don't want the government touching our Medicare system. <laughs> the government is your Medicare system. And it's a single payer system. And people who have it love it. I don't quite understand how we get this enormous political disconnect between, I guess I ran out of time. <laughs> no, I got a few more minutes. <laughs> no, I guess I don't. Yeah, well, there you go. Maybe we can, uh, that was time. All right, Jill did say this talk was too long and I should cut it. But I didn't think she was going to do this to me. All right. Uh, so single payer is simply a, a way to sh put the cost over everybody equally. So somebody who is young and thinks that they're uh, uh, not vulnerable to any disease and therefore doesn't have health care insurance and then unfortunately gets terribly ill and comes in and we pay for that. If we had in the entire pool, everyone's in the entire pool, the cost, the average cost of health care insurance, of course, would go down because we had, would have healthy people in it. We need a system. We don't have a system. We've talked about that. We need to incentivize some of the choices that people have made. Uh, our dean can't get an appointment with an internist for a routine examination because there are no general internists anymore. They're all going into subspecialty work. And why is that? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but one of the most important reasons is the average medical student finishes Hopkins $150,000 in debt. And so they're looking at how do I get out of this $150,000 of debt? I still have more, you know, residency training and fellowship training to do, and that's the quickest way. And of course, everybody likes to live in the same areas where we all like to live, so we have to also have incentives for people to live in underserved areas. You can make this work, but you can only make this work if you actually have a system that's uh, transparent and you can look at all the moving parts and that's not what we have. And of course, we all believe evidence-based medicine, quality assurance, preventive services, uh, not fee-for-service, but in my view, and I think in a number of people's, a sort of population perspective capitation. So why is that important? So a, a population perspective capitation is much like the UK's uh, National Health Service, so there are lots of things we don't like about that. But basically, if I, you know, worked in the National Health Service, I'm responsible for the health, the health of, you know, roughly 1,500 people. That changes the whole dynamics from when I'm responsible for taking care of your acute heart attack or your indigestion. I'm responsible for your health. So how does that change it? So here, here would be a report card in the United States for Al Somer when he was an ophthalmologist. So uh, somebody comes to me because they have complicated glaucoma or they just have a cataract and I operate on them and then I get graded on how well did I do that operation. And that's basically what we, that's what we call quality today. We don't do it very well uh, in, in measuring it, but if we did do, that's what we would be doing. Now, in capitation, from a population perspective, if I'm responsible for the health of the people that I'm responsible for, then it's not enough that somebody who is sent to me with complicated glaucoma, uh, I did a good job on. What is important is that everybody who has complicated glaucoma gets to see me or somebody like me and has it taken care of. And that's very different because we're only talking about this scoring system about people who actually get to the doctor and then the outcome for that procedure is scored. The other is, what about all those people who have never gotten to a physician and need that care? So that would be a different system. It would say, from an ophthalmic perspective, you know, there's a population of 35,000 people and 34,999 of them actually see well because they don't have a cataract or they had a cataract and it was taken out and replace with a trochlear lens, and therefore I get an A-plus score because from a population perspective, I've done a good job. So uh, what's the likelihood of all this happening here in the United States? Well, this is the proportion of people who believe humans developed from earlier species of animals. So it's about 80% for the rest of the world. It's less than a third in the United States. So, you know, my optimism is not very high, and more than anything else, this seems to be the discussion that people are looking at. 
Thank you very much. That was a great talk. Do you want to do some Q&A or do you yeah, want to yeah, go to yeah, the Whichever. whichever. Okay. Yeah. So why, uh, why don't we take a few minutes and do some Q&A? So I'm sure there's some rejoinders in the audience or uh, somebody might want to ask a question. If not, we can move to Feinstone and uh, do the book signing. But no burning issues? No? So, so the talk was long, and the book is short. Yeah. Well, yes. you <laughs> so, so uh, I actually, if Jill would have let me give a longer talk, I was going to end with two different slides. One said, why, you know, I started with why write a book. Then I was going, why write a little book? And then the last slide was, because it has everything you need to know and not one bit more. 